Well, welcome everybody to the Resilient Leadership Podcast, where everything that we talk about is aimed at helping you to lead with a greater sense of calm, clarity, and conviction, even in anxious times. My name is Bridget Tyre, and as always, I'm fortunate to be joined by my co-host and collaborator, Irvin Nugent. Irvin, how the heck are you today? I am doing great. Thank you so much. As we record this, we're about to go into November, so probably you'll be listening to this in November, and it's like, oh my God, where did 2024 go? Ah. But uh, I am excited. I'm excited. to. I love Thanksgiving, and I love this season. So mm-hmm. how about you, Bridget? How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks for asking there, Irvin. I'm excited to have this conversation. And I, you know, to our listeners, if you, uh, if you tuned into our last episode, Irvin teed up this conversation, but Irvin, why don't you remind them what's on tap today? Yeah. So in this episode and the next one, we're going to focus in on six pitfalls that can trip up even the best of managers. I know, Bridget, you and I have been working in organizations for many, many years. And we've just seen these. We've seen you and and at times even seasoned managers fall prey to them um, mm-hmm. without really intending to it or even realizing they're doing doing it. And the impact really can be quite significant. So whether you're just promoted, you're listening here and you've got, hey, I'm a new manager, I got promoted. Or if you're saying there, oh, I've seen it all, I say, well, <laughs> have you really? Um, <laughs> then I invite you to kind of listen in because I really think you're going to appreciate maybe some of these pitfalls and how they show up. So Bridget, what's your game plan? What three are we going to tackle today? All right. So we are going to tackle the following three pitfalls. So number one, failure to delegate. Mm. Failure to delegate fully and effectively. Second one is over-functioning. I think people have heard that before if they've tuned into our podcast. But if you haven't, Not to worry, we're going to talk in depth about that pitfall. And three, fusing with followers. Now, here's the thing about these first three pitfalls. Any one of them can trip us up and interfere with our ability to fulfill our potential, grow and scale our teams, and really get that elusive work-life balance that so many people seek, right? So that's really what's at stake with these pitfalls. And as you said, Irvin, the bottom line is, Even some very seasoned leaders that I've worked with have fallen into these traps, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about them. But first, I want to share a couple of statistics that I just think are really important as context for today's conversation. And they both come out of Gallup and the research that they've done around managers and organizations. Uh, And if you want to know more about them, it comes from a, a book called It's the Manager by Jim Collins. So here's the first stat. The quality of managers and team leaders is the single biggest factor in an organization's long-term success. Wow, think about that. Mm -hmm. The single biggest factor. I think if we polled our listeners and said, what do you think is the single biggest factor in an organization's long-term success? I'm not sure we would have gotten that answer. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. I think that's profound. And then secondly, the single biggest factor In a successful team, an engaged team, a team that's thriving is the quality of the manager. And it has to do with how they play to their strengths, their own level of engagement, and how they communicate with their teams. Mm -hmm. And so to me, what these stats reveal and they underscore is the incredible, profound role that managers play. And I don't think those of us who are in those roles necessarily realize Mm. just uh, how impactful Mm. we can be and are for better, for worse. And so Irvin, I always kind of, I'm curious, like when you were managing and when you had that title, did you realize the impact of your role on the organization's long-term success and just on people's ability to thrive? No, not really. I think the temptation is to look at this big organization and there's so many things. And so often, and I know my experience and in working with clients has been that we tend to focus on things that we don't have control over. And we put a lot of, we say that has a big influence, but in reality, you know, it is, I mean, I remember, you know, it's a famous quote, I'm sure many of you heard it, you know, but 
kind of gets to the core of this. You know, people don't leave organizations, they leave bad bosses or bad managers. And so in reality, there are many things going on in an organization, but that core relationship that impacts daily how we show up, how, how we're motivated is, in fact, that, that intimate relationship with the manager. That, And I think managers really need to understand that, that they really have an influence that is central, really, to the mission of the organization. Mm-hmm. Indeed, they do. So, you know, let's talk then about that first pitfall yeah. that I spoke I'm about. Intrigued right? Because I, I, I tell you, if, there, if, there's, <laughs> if there's one of my pitfalls that I knew, it, it was that failure to, and for many reasons, I suppose, a failure to delegate. So I'm curious, talk to us a little bit more about, about that pitfall and how it comes up. Okay. So you related to that one in your own oh, personal really? experience? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So I, I was surprised to find, I think, as I started coaching more and more and more senior level people, that, you know, I assumed that, that they knew how to delegate. They delegated fully and really well. Because here's the thing. Everybody listening to us right now intellectually knows that's a main part of their job. Yep. I mean, we're not telling you anything you don't know. But what, what fascinated me is that even though they know they were supposed to do it, it didn't mean they were doing it. Mm-hmm. And it didn't mean they were doing it enough to actually get the results that they wanted, Right. And so that's some curious thing. Like, why do you know you're supposed to delegate and yet you don't? And so what are some of the things that get in the way? So I'm going to share some and then Irvin, I'm curious what you've seen get Mm -hmm. people's way. But I think one of the things I learned as I coach people is um, sometimes they don't delegate because there are certain things they love to do and are good at and they just don't want to give them up. Yeah. Right. Now, is that a problem? Well, it is if you end up being overwhelmed and you don't have time to do the things that only you can do as a manager, you know, like set a strategic mm-hmm. direction for your team. Yeah. But sometimes we cling to those things because they, they were our source of competence and strength, mm-hmm. right? So that's one thing. Another one, and this one I came to a little bit later, and that is that sometimes our identity, our sense of self of how we define who we are and what success looks like, right? Comes from being an individual contributor or a subject matter expert, but not a manager necessarily. We haven't, we haven't let go of one identity and embodied and embraced the identity of a manager, which is really about getting results through other people, not right. And that's a, that's an identity shift and those are not easy. And then the third one, I see a lot is a lack of trust. When I when I really push my clients to say, okay, like what's going on here? Why are you not letting go? And they will often say, I can't because I don't trust the people to deliver. Of right. course, that then begs a whole conversation, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, okay, we can't just leave it at that. It's like, well, then how do you get the trust that you need, right? Anyways, True. those are some of the the barriers to delegating that I that I've discovered, and I'm curious, how about you? Yeah, there's a couple of others that I would add, and uh, the first one is my is the one that I encountered a lot in myself, and I find it more and more in, in managers, and that is the sense of guilt that mm. it's this rationalization. I literally cannot give my employees anything more; they'll either be burdened or they'll break, and this yeah. is you know, and and I fell into that. I hear it now, you know, kind of where I work and you work as well in organizations that are very stressed and and there's sometimes shortage of employees, et cetera. And we get into that. So we just can't give anything more. And I found myself kind of getting into that as well. And of course, I think what helped me reframe that is that I'm delegating not to get work off my lap, but delegation has other purposes. Delegation is about development. It's about expanding talent as well. And so yeah. I think it's a nice way of, of getting over that. The other thing is this pressure to perform. The reality is some people want it. We have to prove ourselves, our reputation. And so if that's the case, then why would I give it to someone who may not do as good a job as I will? And, you know, what if the work doesn't measure up to the standards? And, you know, and this is especially, you know, when you're in a new role, there is this inner dialogue going on within you. Like, I need to perform. I need to mm-hmm. prove myself. And that can be a real driver into avoiding delegation. 
the third one I would mention is something we're seeing a lot is just pure overwhelm. That yeah. we are in the weeds so much that we're consumed with, you know, what we have to do that we really don't even take the time to think about delegating. It's, it doesn't even arise because we're so in it. And part of the management is to kind of be able to step back and go, hey, what's happening here? But just mm-hmm. because we, are, we're, we don't see it, so we don't. Yeah. I relate to all of those as well. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, Bridget, then what thoughts do you have of getting over some of these barriers? Well, you know, it, it really begins with self-awareness, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Like you've got you've to figure out really what is the barrier that keeps you from letting go and delegating fully. So we named several, but for everybody listening, there's a different barrier for you than somebody else. And you got to face into that barrier. What is it? Is it that identity issue? Is it that pressure you feel to, to perform and to excel? Is it that you're just too damn busy and you never stop long enough? You're like, I don't have time to delegate, you know? Mm-hmm. And then you kind of like, you got to challenge your assumptions that you're making. Because like, if it's trust, you're making a lot of assumptions there that you haven't challenged and then that you have to figure out, right, what you're going to do about that. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's the way out. I want to say one other thing before I ask you to share with listeners what the second pitfall is. But when it comes to this pitfall, it's not just that we don't always delegate. It's that when we do, we don't necessarily do it very well. That's a problem too, yeah. right? So I'm just going to say really quickly, there are three really important ingredients for effective delegation. One is clarity. You've got to take the time to get clear on what it is you expect, need, and want. And a lot of times managers don't. So they delegate, but the person doesn't really know what they want and doesn't feel free to ask, yeah. right? So that's the thing. The second ingredient after clarity is context. When you delegate, it is vital to give people the greater context around that task and how it connects with the bigger picture, how it connects with strategic priorities and why the heck it matters. Because if you don't do that, then those tasks become, they can become a grind. Mm. And then the last thing is when you're delegating, what you want to forge is a commitment you can count on that you can be confident in. Yeah. And okay. and not just somebody nodding their head and saying, okay. Yeah. Right. But like, yeah. really, are you okay? Because let's talk about this deadline that I'm suggesting. Right. Okay. So enough said on that, but inviting our listeners to consider whether your pitfall is that you are not fully and effectively delegating and therefore you are getting in the way of development, but also not freeing yourself to do what that which only you can do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's another pitfall? What's number two? Tell them a little bit about that. Yeah, we were just talking about this before we were recording. This is this is an epidemic. And that is what we have called overfunctioning. Now we have mentioned this before on the podcast. And just as a reminder, this is, you know, a failing to delegate is a form of overfunctioning. But you know, overfunctioning is is much more than that. It's not you know, overfunctioning. Sometimes we think about, well, I'm I'm doing too many things. Ah, but that's really not what overfunctioning is about. It's not the core of what we understand. Because overfunctioning means to think, feel. This is thinking and feeling and acting for others in a way that erodes the other person's capacity for ownership or effective action. So mm-hmm. it's not just doing, but it's this thinking and the feeling, and it's truly an occupational hazard for for leaders because. Who do we tend to make managers? Who do we tend to make leaders? <laughs> yeah. the people that do. It's the people that, you know, and and parents as well. Parenting. I'm not a parent, but I have four sisters and, and I, I see this all the time as well. And, you know, what's driving it? What's driving it is this anxiety. So it's not so much something we choose, but mm-hmm. rather this is a reactive, a reactive pattern that manages that anxiety we're feeling. And in the short term, it'll, it can make us feel calmer because we kind of think, okay, you know, I'm, I've got the situation. But really, it's creating longer term problems. Mm-hmm. So say, for example, um, there's a manager and, and they're asked questions and they feel kind of responsible. Oh, my God, I have to answer every question or solve every problem 
that's brought to my table. And that's really yeah. that, that feeling of I have to or emotionally wind up in this. This is the overfunctioning. In that situation, instead of actually coaching their employees, okay, let me let me coach you through this and and build up their own solutions, their sense of being able to to solve the problems. The manager ends up thinking for them, taking that emotional burden on, and mm-hmm. so you know that over dependence on the manager. Really, what's happening is it's really eroding some of the growth and the development of the team. Yeah, Can you think of any, another example? What you've seen of of over functioning, Bridget? Oh, well, I just had a client complain about their manager and boy, they were hot about this Mm -hmm. because my client was working on a complex, highly visible project that her manager was getting a lot of pressure to make sure that this thing turned out a certain Mm -hmm. way. And when some challenges began to arise, the manager swooped in and started to micromanage, right? Mm -hmm. And we've talked about this before, but micromanaging is an example of overfunctioning. And in this case, what she did was she started showing up at team meetings that she had not been to before and hovering and inserting herself and asking questions and challenging the team who was close to the work and doing it. You know, why are you doing it that way? Anyways, it was so frustrating for my client. To your point about anxiety being the driver of overfunctioning, that's exactly what was going on. She was getting pressure from her boss and the C-suite, make sure that project turns out a certain way. Mm. And her anxiety spilled over onto the team and became a source of interference. So I see it all the time. I hear about it all the time. It's an epidemic, you know, and in terms of great managers, even the best sometimes get tripped up by this, don't they, Irvin? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And so, you know, we've mentioned another form of overfunctioning previously. I, I want to throw this one over to you, Irvin, and that is in the feeling domain, like you mentioned, right? Mm. Which is when we worry a lot about everybody being happy. Yeah. Oh, this is where overfunctioning just comes out. Because basically, you know, what's happening here is if we fall into this trap is that, you know, we're getting stuck in this responsibility of others. Mm-hmm. And it's about us carrying things that really aren't ours to carry. Mm -hmm. Like, boy, if you're in the game of making other people happy and you feel that burden and responsibility, you know, when you think about it, that's just something you can't control. And so where should the focus be? Well, maybe the focus should be on, can I create an environment where people can engage to do their best work? That's something I can do. I can create this, this, this learning environment But if we're chasing employee happiness, it's just going to lead to burnout because, you know, that's an unwinnable pursuit. I think you're right. We have mentioned in an earlier podcast. So, you know, if you want to kind of focus in on that and and dive a little bit more, because I'm sure many people can resonate to it, it might be a a useful episode for you. Yeah, I think it it was called Stop Chasing Employee Happiness. Mm, Start focusing on engagement instead. I do not remember what the number was, but you can find that if you want to take a deeper dive specifically on that. But yeah, so, so important because at the end of the day, overfunctioning is the chief cause of burnout. Yeah. And it is about carrying the weight of things that aren't Mm. ours to carry, right? So Bridget, how can you avoid that? It's so common. And yet, how might our listeners avoid that tendency? Yeah, I think it all comes down to being a very good observer of yourself and noticing when, where, and with whom do you tend to overfunction? What is your Achilles heel? Who is your Achilles heel? You know, you mentioned parents and your four sisters, right? Mm. I'm guessing some of their kids are an Achilles heel for them. Yeah. But at work, there are certain people that we rush in to rescue prematurely you know, or certain situations that trigger us to overfunction. And I don't think we can interrupt this pattern until we become aware of when and where we do it. Mm. So observe with curiosity first. And then as you notice it, see if you can catch yourself Mm. thinking, feeling, or doing for others and interrupt the pattern. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that. Now, when you were managing people in teams, did you tend to overfunction? I did. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was your Achilles heel? Do you know? I think it was a fear that if I didn't intervene, that things would fall apart. And not that that was my response, but I felt that responsibility and it really was a burden. 
And I felt that, well, if I don't do this, then who's going to do it? Well, maybe the person employed to do it should be doing it. But, you know, that didn't really, that logical thing <laughs> didn't happen. And so it was, well, no, I have to because it will fall apart. And there's many reasons for that. But just that was my, you know, that rationale. Off, and it's such a great rationale. I'm keeping the ship running. Yeah. I'm not a wonderful person, you know. It's yeah. amazing. There's a feeling of good in it, but then that eventually that weight, that burden, you know, that responsibility is very heavy. Yeah. You know what? What you just said provoked this for me, which is there's a seductive quality mm, to yes. overfunctioning. Yes. Because we kind of feel like very, you know, all that, right? Look at all yeah. I do. You know yeah. what I mean? Not realizing that it's not a sustainable pattern. Yeah. And we will grow resentful. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, that thought that sometimes if some people would like, like I can I almost hear some people saying to me, God, thank God, Irvin, you know, if it wasn't for you, <laughs> and that, what if it wasn't for you? Like, like, whoa, like, what, what, it's not wonderful to hear. And yet, you know, and so that just kind of reiterates the kind of the behavior that you're in. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yes. I yeah. love it. So Bridget, um, how about this third pitfall? Where are we going to now? Yeah, so the third pitfall is fusing with followers. Mm. Again, an easy thing that even very senior level people, a pitfall for them. I do think people who are managing for the first time, if they can be particularly vulnerable to this if they've been promoted out of their peer group. But what does it mean fusing with followers? And really what it means is this, that we're just too close, too chummy, too friendly, too enmeshed with the people that we're supervising. And sure, is it nice to be friendly with people that you work with and, and supervise? Yes. Are you friends? No, not really. You know, not the same thing. And when we become too close and enmeshed, certain things happen. And so that's how you know, like I'm, I'm imagining maybe some our listeners saying like, well, how do I know if I'm too close? Like what's too close? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I think there are some signposts, right? So one of the signposts that you are probably too close with, with some of your followers is that there's a perception, whether it's true or not, there's a perception that you play favorites and everybody knows who your favorites are, right? Oh yeah. He, you know, he always protects her. He always agrees with him. He takes her to lunch doesn't hold, you know, her account, whatever the case may be. And that's something to be on the lookout for, right? Because isn't it natural that sometimes we just do like certain people that we supervise better than others? Of course, but it can't be so obvious as that, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's a signpost. Maybe there's too much closeness with some of the people that, that you manage. And then I think another thing is if you're really struggling to hold people accountable and give people tough, but vital feedback. And, you know, mm -hmm. lots of people do struggle with that, but check into what's holding you back because it might be that you're so close to some of the people you manage, you feel so friendly with them, so connected to them that the idea of giving them this tough feedback is particularly challenging for you. I mean, nobody loves it, but yeah. when you feel really close to somebody, it's even harder, don't you think, Irvin? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of what I see. But what are some other indicators? You know, kind of continuing that theme as well, maybe, and to draw it out about being overly friendly or or, or maybe a way of expressing it, being too casual, maybe, with, with the team. And, you know, you know, it's one thing to going to go into happy hour and to kind of socializing, but this is a little bit more. This is kind of, you know, maybe going out with them, drinking too much, staying too long, and then this is it, getting caught up in workplace gossip. Oh, yeah. You know? And so that's so seductive because like it's a thing that people will trust you more. And really, you know, in one way you can see people like I'm one of the gang and, and rather than standing apart, you know, and this is really seductive for new managers, especially when new managers have been promoted from the gang. You know, I always say, you know, one of the tough things about being a new manager is you've got to recreate boundaries. And that's yeah. not the responsibility of the team. It's your responsibility. And just getting that right is tricky, but it's something yes. really important. So it is. And then I would say, and kind of like a close cousin of this one is really being consumed by what the employees think of you, you know? And yeah. so this, this, you know, do they like me? Am I popular? 
And that's normal and healthy. You know, uh, who doesn't want to work in a workplace where people like you and you're friends with the employees? And But that pursuit can really get in the way of, of what's needed at times to lead. There's a balance there. Yeah. yeah I like how you said that that pursuit can yeah. get in the way. Yeah. 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 All right. So Irvin, you probably can guess what question I'm going to ask you, but when you were <laughs> managing and leading, did you ever fuse with your followers in any way? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, you know, and, and it was more the gossip, but you know what it was? It was, and this is very seductive and I've seen it in myself and in others is when people have complaints about the upper management. So mm-hmm. when I wasn't, you know, in upper management, it was, oh, yeah. And so you join them. is isn't like yeah, the CEO is a disaster. Yeah, the CEO couldn't make a decision that they were paid to do. And it's so easy to kind of band with the team. And yet you as a manager, you have a different role there. You're reflecting a different level. And so when you join with them, you actually are getting in the way of management functioning. And so that's important. Mm-hmm. It's really seductive. Mm-hmm. And I think... You know, that kind of brings up that the core, and we've said this before, like really at the heart of this is that there's a balance. And this balance is close enough that we want to influence those around it, but then at times distant so that we can lead. And and that's um, not an exact silence. It's there's there's a, always a balance there. And it means, you know, that that close enough in the sense that that employees know that you care about them and that you're willing to provide them with guidance and support that they need to be successful, but then also distant enough to lead that you're not just another person in the gang, that you actually are leading them and at times have to confront or at times have to to give bad news and all the things that goes with management and leadership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we fuse with followers, we lose some of our differentiation. Yeah. which we did a whole episode on that, yeah. right? And yeah. just recently. Yeah, yeah. And so at the end of the day, people can't really see us as the leader fully because we're too enmeshed. Yeah. And when that happens, we lose influence. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So I'm curious, um, now that we've come to the, the end of the first three, um, we always try and end with a practice bridge. What comes to your mind that might be a way of, of practicing these first three pitfalls? Yeah. So today's practice is called pick your pitfall. <laughs> so we said we're going to share six, but this is a, a double header, like you said, Irvin. So yeah, today yeah. we only shared three. So pick your pitfall of these three and find something that you can be mindful of. So one, is it a failure to delegate often enough or effectively? Is it over-functioning or is it perhaps fusing with followers? There's probably a pitfall in there that you have fallen into from time to time. And the idea here is to pick one and in the next two weeks, bring your attention, your mindfulness to noticing this tendency, this vulnerability, either in yourself or maybe in somebody that you manage. Maybe they've, they are really vulnerable to that pitfall. And see what you notice, because when we begin to observe a pitfall, boy, it's a whole lot easier to not step in it, right? Yeah, absolutely. So true. What a great conversation, Irvin. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. I can't wait for the next episode where we will have pitfalls four through six. Thank you for a great conversation. I hope everyone will do well and muddle through these and think about these pitfalls and, and really kind of like, where do they apply for me? Like, like, where have I seen myself? I think they'll be really helpful. And look forward to seeing you uh, in the next episode. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. <laughs>